first 15 minutes, but then we will be exclusively available on that sweet stream of freedom that we call Rumble, because this is a critical moment, not only in British politics, but in the fight against the globalist establishment in your country and in our country. For the first 15 minutes, we'll be talking to George Galloway here on YouTube about the war, about the Uniparty, about our slide towards techno-feudalism and about what we can do to oppose it. Can parliamentary or congressional politics ever become a tool for its own demise and destruction? And what kind of radical figures will we have to support? What kind of new alliances will we have to make? What kind of global position will we have to take on subjects as wide and varied as war and commerce and migration if we are to stop this descent into new techno tyranny? And who better to talk to you about that than our guest today, the great George Galloway, a man who has once again taken parliament by the scruff of the neck, has bruised little Rishi Sunak and given him a new nickname in the process, the Member of Parliament for Rochdale, George Galloway. Thanks for coming on Stay Free today. Uh, welcome. Uh, always a pleasure. Privilege to talk with you in a brilliant jacket, by the way. Excellent. I thank you so much for spontaneously noticing that jacket, George. Now, what people say about you, even within the legacy media, is that you are a street fighting politician who knows how to win elections. There is some division because you have come to prominence, of course, on a powerful mandate against the ongoing massacre or genocide is perhaps the term you would use to describe the thousands and thousands of deaths that are taking place in Gaza right now to a degree, supported by arms provided from the United States of America and certainly not uh, opposed or shut down by either our country or by the United States of America. I wonder, given that uh, overnight images have been released of drone strikes within Gaza that appear to be striking civilians, how you feel about that ongoing conflict, what your victory uh, as a, a, the Member of Parliament for Rochdale signifies about about domestic populations' views uh, regarding this conflict and others in the UK and the United States of America? Well, my blood runs alternately uh, boiling hot and uh, chilled cold because I've seen so much now. I've never seen so much in my whole life. Uh, wholesale slaughter of the innocents, for the most part, 72% of all the dead and mutilated people in Gaza were women or children, mothers and their children very often. Uh, it is unconscionable that this has been allowed to go on for so long. It would not have been allowed to go on for so long were uh, the attack dog in question not been uh, the permanently attached attack dog of the United States and of Great Britain. We invented the state of Israel. We promised it to a small group, actually, of English Jews uh, at the time of the Balfour Declaration. We promised them the land which belonged to a third people, namely the Palestinian people. And then we descended down this bloody staircase to the hell that we're watching today. Uh, and so sometimes I'm boiling mad. Sometimes tears are running down my cheeks. Uh, sometimes my heart feels numb at the sheer scale and nature of the slaughter. And they say that I ran my by-election on Gaza. Well, if I did, then Gaza won. And the political class needs to take heed of it. Because I didn't just win, Russell. I beat the Tories, Labour, Liberal Democrat and Reform all together. I got more votes than all of them put together. That is a landslide. And if a landslide was achieved in a kind of referendum on Gaza, then Gaza won. So what are the governing parties going to do about it? There are some signs of movement in the United States and in the UK, but the slaughter continues. The starvation continues. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are galloping across Gaza. War, famine, pestilence, and disease are now everywhere. And of course, it will not be contained in this tiny piece of land when disease, famine, uh, and all the attendant conditions that come with it begin to spread. They'll spread into Israel first and foremost. And given a very large number of Israelis 
are dual nationals of the US, of the UK, and so on. God knows what diseases are going to be traveling around the world as a direct result of the policy of siege and sanction and slaughter uh, that we've got going on in Gaza. But of course, the truth is, and you know this, I didn't actually only fight the election on Gaza. I fought it on the uni party, the two cheeks of the same backside, and all their failures, all their disappointments, all their betrayals of British people as a whole of all kinds, colors, and creeds. The Uniparty is, I suppose, the greatest threat that we all face, whether it's in our country here in the UK or in the United States of America. And indeed, your success in this election and the astonishing triumph that Bobby Kennedy is demonstrating across polls in America now shows that there has long been an appetite for meaningful candidates. Even though, even in offering these two examples of success, we are confronted with the significance and complication of the issue that we're talking about now. Media spaces have been divided by this war. We, I know uh, when we've spoken before, George, how you deplore all forms of racism and surely anti-Semitism is a form of racism. And this issue is continually used to create division. It's created division in an emergent peripheral anti-establishment right wing movement that was growing in America, mostly in the kind of media spaces that you and I are now familiar with. Commentators like Stephen Crowder and Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson. We've just heard that Candace Owens has left the Daily Wire, no doubt because, in part, because of the stance she's taken on this particular war and the perspective that the Daily Wire and its affiliation with the faith of Judaism and the nation of Israel, understandable given the founders, has caused rifts and division in a space that was starting to coalesce around anti-establishmentism. Also, on the left, George, what I find fascinating in is that, that many groups and individuals that were unwilling to talk up on the matter of censorship and media control are starting to notice that when it comes to the subject of Palestine and in particular this conflict, there is a great deal of censorship, with many people arguing that part of the reason that the US government wants to bring down TikTok is because it's a place where reporting on Gaza has been accurate and revealing. So this conflict is very, very unique and shows us the nature of the challenge we now face. Because if there is to be success against the Uniparty, it seems to me that communities that are directly opposed on important issues are going to have to find common ground if we're going to make a dent in the significant power of that party. Do you see alliances as being a, poss a possibility, George? And are you looking to make those kind of alliances? Uh, well, first of all, free speech has to be that common ground. Uh, I have to be able to speak my truth on Israel-Palestine, and uh, Shapiro uh, has to uh, be able to speak his. I can't close him down. He can't close me down. If we get into the business, in the anti-establishment periphery that you talk about, of actually turning on each other's right to speak, uh, then we have no chance whatsoever of uh, dealing the uni party, the globalists, the real deep-seated problem that we have, with no chance of turning them over, no chance of replacing them. So free speech has to be the common ground. I happen to believe that even in the last 48 hours, uh, there's reason to believe that some elements of the right of that anti-establishment periphery are uh, coming around to my point of view on Israel-Palestine. Alec Jones, for example, is now uh, to the left of Joe Biden. Uh, the um, Tucker Carlson in the last 24 hours, Candace Owens in the uh, last uh, two or three, four weeks. These are people that are not of the left, uh, but they are people who were a part of our periphery uh, who are now beginning to challenge uh, what was the prevailing orthodoxy on the right on this question. Uh, and I'm very glad about that, especially people who said America first. You can't say America first if it's actually Israel first, because Israel might do things that are not in America's interests. But if you have already given them a blank check, a green light, then they're going to go. And indeed, Netanyahu today has said 
that whatever the Americans say, he's going to invade uh, the tent city of Rafa uh, with his army. What could possibly go wrong? There's only 1.7 million people living there in tents. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, but yes, alliances, if not electoral alliances, then an alliance that we must defend each other's right to speak freely uh, is, I think, a precondition of progress. Uh, but we are standing in hundreds of constituencies on May 2nd in the local council elections, and then on what seems to be October 17th in the British general election. We are prepared to negotiate with others, uh, but um, it's far better to stand as an organized force than as an isolated uh, independent. Because unless you're really well known, I mean, Russell Brand independent would be one thing, and we'd be fully behind you. Uh, the, uh, there are one or two others. But unless you're already a big established name, standing as an independent doesn't quite do it because you've got no logo on the ballot paper. How do people know which of the many independents on that ballot paper you are? Far better to stand as an organized force. So more and more people are choosing to stand under the workers' rubric uh, with, and uh, under our logo, the roundup, uh, red, white, and blue, because we are patriotic, you see. We say it's the globalists who are the traitors to Britain, not us. We have nowhere else to go. Uh, we are not people from anywhere. We have no green card for California. We're stuck here on this rain-soaked but beautiful and green island. And so who could be more patriotic than we who are here and must remain here, have no alternatives but to remaining here? Uh, so our red, white, and blue uh, roundel and cog uh, is a symbol of what we stand for and where we stand. I'm fascinated about the possibility that the Workers' Party could make a significant impact in the forthcoming election in our country. 2024 is a big election year in our country and in the United States of America, and we are seeing the resurgence of revitalized anti-establishment politics, both on the left and the right. And God knows that to oppose the Uniparty and this evident globalist plan to assert a techno-feudalist style system on us all, we need to find ways ways of working together. I'm sure many of our viewers will know you, George, for your uh, historic affiliation with social socialism. Many of our viewers will know that you're a working class man from a working class background, a blue collar man who believes in the empowerment of ordinary people, ordinary workers. So perhaps it's not fair to say that important issue, though it is, that your victory in Rochdale was entirely based on the strong anti-war sentiment that many people feel. And to give Tucker Carlson his due, as a matter of fact, I've always known him to be anti-war across the board. A lot of, indeed, American nativists or America first uh, pundits and political figures, while dismissed widely as racist, often seem to me to be nationalist in a somewhat 20th century sense, not the worst kind of national socialism sense, I'm, I'm keen to add, but just that they believe in the people of their nation. And if nation is so something that's real, surely there could be some kind of bargain, pact, agreement that were there to be controls on migration, controls on the border, this must surely be accompanied by a strong anti-war commitment not to intervene and intercede and disrupt those nations from which migrants tend to come. And of course, I know that what's important to you, George, is that those nations are losing many of their best and brightest doctors, medics and professionals professionals, as well as the many economic migrants, refugees, however that you want to describe them. Do you consider it to be interesting, George, the possibility that um, a non-imperialist, non-interventionist model, i.e. an anti-globalist model might mean don't get involved in wars, don't get involved in exploiting the resources of these countries, and therefore it seems more reasonable and practical to manage borders sensibly? Because I know that people might be surprised to hear some of your views on migration. Yeah, perfectly put. That is the case. Uh, only a fool or an anarchist or a 
or, or a very, very rich man uh, could possibly want open borders. Uh, I, I, I'm the leader of the workers. So part of my job, a very important part of it, is to raise the price of labor, uh, the price of work. And of course, to do that, I have to control the supply of labor. Otherwise, the price of work will plummet. The pressure on the public services, uh, council housing, national health service, places, places in the schools, in the nurseries, and so on, will become broken. It will become impossible for the people I represent, who are, of course, of all colors. We are a multicolored, multicultural country. So there's nothing racist about it. In fact, the, the free movement of labor that we had before Brexit was white labor from the European Union. It had nothing to do with color or race. It had to do with the supply of labor. And with an endless supply of labor, you have a constantly falling price of labor. Obviously, if I'm the trade union official negotiating with the factory owner and he tells me I've got 5,000 Bulgarians outside who are going to do the job cheaper than your members, I'm finished. I could use another F word, but won't. Uh, the, the reality is that this tendency of liberals, and they are liberals actually, small l liberals, uh, to apply ists and isms as pejoratives uh, to ordinary people merely standing up for their own interest is one of the reasons why leftism has such a bad name. And I'm one of those who no longer wants to hear myself described as a leftist, because left has become synonymous with liberalism, with license, uh, with open borders, uh, with, uh, you know, refugees welcome here, and so on. All this is inimical to the interests of the working class of all colors who are already here. Now, you are quite right to identify that one of the drivers of mass immigration, of flows of refugees, is the endless making of war on the poor countries of the global south. Whether it's full out hot war or economic war or overthrowing popular governments, replacing them with dictatorships like in Latin America, for example, uh, that's what's causing many of these refugee flows. If you stop making war on them, give them a hand up to build their own economies and their own societies, invest a bit in them, the number of people who want to leave their country will be far fewer. Look, I'm an example. Um, my grandparents came here as Irish refugees from hunger from famine. If there's no famine, my grandparents, great-grandparents would never have wanted to leave Ireland. Anyone who's been in Ireland, been in Scotland, knows that Ireland's better. So <laughs> if, 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 you, if you hadn't been driven out of Ireland, you wouldn't be here in the first place. So what, I'm, what I am very interested in is a de facto alliance uh, between the people like Tucker, who are uh, American firstists, who are nativists, if you like. There's no reason for hostility between him and me. I have no interest in the domestic politics of the United States of America. I just don't want them to come here. I don't want them to bomb here or there or elsewhere. I don't want them interfering in other people's countries. I take my hat off to Tucker Carlson. He's, I mean, you and I are both in the broadcasting game. He is captain, my captain. I take my hat off to him. And I like some of the things that he says, dislike some of the other things that he says. But I'm always listening, aren't you? 
Absolutely, I am, because I think these are exactly the kind of relationships that need to be explored. Indeed, in a truly representative system, there would be freedom for a, a degree of true diversity culturally and economically, not just within nations, but within regions, if decentralisation were part of the shared goal. Full autonomy, maximum autonomy, maximum representation. Now, we are going to leave YouTube now precisely because this channel does get subject to a degree of censorship that comes from unelected globalist bodies like the WHO. It does prioritise legacy media outlets that will actively attack independent voices and anti-establishment voices like George Galloway and like my voice. The, indeed, though, one, there's several subjects I want to cover with you, George, not least the subject of faith. I believe you are a, a man of faith. I'm exploring Christianity myself, and I think people of the world who believe in spirituality have perhaps more in common with those of us that are, or those that are brutally materialist and rational to the point that everything ultimately becomes a matter of economics and power dynamics. So we're going to say goodbye to you two. Before we leave, have a quick look at this important message from some of our partners over at Hello, a beautiful prayer app that I've been using. Hey, we've got a lovely partner today. It's our friends at Hallo. Hallo is the number one prayer app in the world. I use it. You can explore Christianity with over 10,000 prayers, meditations and music. And as Lent continues, what better way to deepen your connection to the loving Lord Christ? It's been downloaded 4 million times in 150 countries. A bit like Calm or Headspace, but for Christians. Hallo helps you pray and meditate and sleep better. It's helped me build a daily routine of habit and prayer. I do the rosary. I know it off by heart, except the end bit I've got to learn. That. You can pray alongside Mark Wahlberg, Jim Caviezel, he was Jesus, Jonathan Rumi, he was Jesus in The Chosen. You can choose your own Jesus, what version of Christianity do you want? And you know Jonathan Rumi was my body double in Ballers, Jesus was my body double. Download it today, reclaim your rightful peace and grow closer to God. Go to hallow.com forward slash brand to try the Hallow prayer app. You will love it. Okay, let's get back to the content. If you want to stay with us, then you're going to have to join us over on Rumble. Click the link in the description right now. I'm going to be asking George a variety of sub on, uh, questions on a variety of extremely important topics. One, I want to know about the election that George is going to be fighting. How can it be considered democracy when you've got two globalists like Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak, two friends of the WEF, who have more in common with one another than they do with any of us, presenting themselves as, as opponents in an election? And isn't it just just the same in America. What are we going to do in 2024? How are we going to make an impact? Click the link. Join us there. George, 